Hey, Business of Design listener, wherever you are, I hope it's a great day. And we're going to try something different. This is a live coaching call. I'm going to be speaking with interior design professional Enza Rico. She's in Toronto. And we have met because she has attended some live seminars. She's uh, a practicing member of Business of Design, and she's found herself in a position where she had a few questions. And I thought, why not just take them live? Because if one person has a question, probably more people have a question. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you'd like to participate in the podcast in a live coaching call, let us know. We'd love to include you. Welcome to the Business of Design podcast with Kimberly Selden, brought to you by Business of Design, a coaching community for independent designers like you. We all know design matters. At Business of Design, we think designers matter too. Before we jump in, let's check in with Cheryl and see what's coming up. Just briefly, I know we've mentioned it on the last couple of podcasts, but High Point is coming up, Cheryl. Again, there's still time to sign up and take advantage of the fact that we have our own hotel and travel agent and hotel rooms book up really quickly. What are the dates again, Cheryl? So it's coming up on April 13th to 15th. 15th, sorry. Okay. Um, the cost is uh, $1,195, but registering before the end of the year, because we're really encouraging people to do it, um, is only a 50% deposit because not only should you be signing up for the um, our group trip now, but book your hotels early. They do sell out. We have a block of rooms, um, but again, our the number we could block are limited uh, because they sell out so quickly. So if you want to join us, uh, get in there. It's only 50% before the end of the year, and we will um, hook you up with our travel agent in order to get your room booked as well. Yay. And we'll hang around together at the market, the learnings, the drinking, it'll all be a group and everybody at the market is going to be super jealous. They're not hanging around with us. So uh, (laughs) do come if you've never been to High Point before, do come along. And if you have been to High Point before, but you're looking to enhance and enrich the experience, this is a trip for you. Thanks, Cheryl. Take care. And now back to the show. Hey, Enza, how are you today? Good. How are you, Kimberly? I'm good. I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm maybe a little bit nervous. I've never done a coaching call live before. So, you know, what if I don't have any insights? <laughs> you know, that's running through my mind anyway. How are you? How, how about you? Um, you know, I'm really, I know you're going to have tremendous insights as always, but um I'm a little nervous for sure, but I think it's really, it's going to be a great opportunity. Well, I think it's awesome that you're willing to speak candidly in front of the entire community of people. And I guarantee whatever the questions you have today are, other people have the same questions. So don't get hung up on, gosh, does this make me sound or look bad or whatever? So why don't you start with whatever is pressing right now? What's on your mind? Okay. So there really, I'm in the world of flat fees right now and I'm migrating from hourly. um, And I want to make sure that I migrate successfully so that I get that yes at the consultation. So I found, I've followed your 15 steps to a T for several, several years. And I've had, yes, and I've had tremendous success. It just, it, it makes sense. It flows. It's natural. Um, I feel confident with this fifth, with following the 15 steps. I feel confident with the hourly. And now that I'm moving towards flat fees where, and I'm going to tell you, I really feel like my clients are really wanting flat fees. Mm-hmm. I want to be equally successful. So, so like one of the kind of the biggest first questions I have are, is what are like some of the effective surefire ways to get a yes from the client when presenting flat fees at the, at the consultation? And I'll just elaborate. In the contract, and I've reviewed the contract very thoroughly as well as read your flat fee book as well as taken um, your in-person course just to make sure I'm successful. I think you should be teaching this stuff now. (laughs) Okay, not overkill at all, but I really want to make sure I'm very successful. So in the contract, we show flat fees for steps three to five as an amount, and then we communicate that the second flat fee will be determined at the presentation, and it's based on a percentage of uh, percent of budget. Right. So I'm wondering if clients at the initial meeting, when we review the contract, Um, 
uh, how will they feel? Well, they feel it's going to be too costly when you add up both fees. Um, so how can we address that so we get success? Because we are really breaking it down into two fees. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So um, the way that I stumbled on breaking up the flat fee into multiple fees um, is because of commercial projects we were doing. And in a commercial job, your flat fee consists of several flat fees that are totaled at the end uh, for one large flat fee. Uh, In other words, we start with research. We have to go and research the space and uh, do some measuring and inventory what's required, and that's one fee. And then the second fee would be design development. We are taking our initial thoughts and putting them on paper and getting the board to sign off on them, and that's another fee. And then a third fee would be to continue the design development all the way to a presentation, and that's another fee. And then after that, there's implementation and tendering, and those are different fees. So I realized that with commercial projects, we were making enough money, and we were getting paid for the amount of time, which means expertise, we were putting into the project. But with with residential projects, we were getting creamed. And the reason we were getting creamed is because we were trying to give clients a flat fee on day one that would cover a huge amount of time and a whole bunch of unknowns and variables. So instead we said, hey, what if we just gave them a flat fee up to step five, which is really manageable. We know what happens in step three, four, and five. We can figure out how many hours it'll take us to complete those three steps and we'll give them a flat fee. And then I tell the clients, like after that, if you don't want to go forward with us, you'll have everything you need to do this project without us. And they get that. They go, okay, that seems fair enough. If it's going to be X number of dollars for you to present to us a completed design scheme, including what everything costs. That sounds pretty good. And then I tell them the next part of that is project management. If they want us to do project management, there is a fee associated. But the genius of the project management fee is that if you're sharing your discounts, as we do, we don't do markup, we share discounts, we share preferred pricing that the trades provide us, and we share a discount from manufactured manufacturer's suggested retail on goods. So those discounts are substantial, and in almost 100% of the cases, our project management fees are written off by those discounts. So in fact, what I tell the clients is really what you're paying for is the design upfront steps three to five. And these are things that clients can't do. The clients can't mobilize 20 trades to come to their house in a single day where we can, right? The clients can't um, manage selecting every single thing for the project, including the toilet, the hardware, the towels, the tile, the shower jam, the shower jets. They can't manage doing that all at once. We can. So they're willing to pay for that because that feels like something that's really big. And then what I found is sometimes clients think, oh, we can handle the project management. But once we do that presentation, they're so blown away that they, and they consider the fact that it's almost free for us to do the project management invariably 100% of the time they say, okay, you do the project management. Does that make sense? Did that get to the heart of the question? Absolutely. I think that is a great way to get a yes, really where they see that the project management fees will be significantly offset by the sharing of the trade discount and the fact that really they're paying for our expertise up front on the design piece, which they can't do. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. I think that's a great, a great insight for me to be able to sell this. Okay, cool. And the other thing is, you know, um, I always tell clients we build top heavy, you know, our biggest billing is at the beginning because we have to get familiar with the project. We have, a, you know, a hundred trades to mobilize a hundred products to select and price. And we're putting everything on the line at step five. And I can tell them, you know, from experience, I've never had a situation where that's gone badly. Every single time the clients do one of three things, 
They go forward with everything. They go forward with sections of it in a flat fee, or they go forward with the project with some compromises. And um, I've never had a situation, well, there was one situation in 2008 when the economy turned and the clients literally lost both of their jobs in between the time we did the presentation or in the, between the time we did trade day and the time we did the presentation. So that was that was definitely the one time where we had pushback. Uh, but other than that, you should be able to go forward every single time. And you know what? The thing is, Enzo, people ask all the time, like, oh, I'm getting so much pushback from my clients. And I would say it's never about that one moment that you're in. It's three steps back. And the people who are getting pushbacks from clients, I would ask them, are, do you have an incredible intake system? In other words, when that client calls, do you know exactly how that person is going to be handled? Do you get to them in a timely fashion? Do you keep that phone call professional so they know from the first phone call that you're going to be different than the other designers they've worked with? Um, if you do all of those things and then you show up at trade day with all these trades and then you do a um, drop dead gorgeous presentation that has everything in it, they're not going to question your authority anymore. They're not going to shop you and you're just going to avoid a whole bunch of problems. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. I'm going to take a little tangent here. I remember you saying many years ago that you know we follow the contract and we follow the 15 steps to a T and we're... <laughs> When we don't do that, it always comes to bite us. Oh my us. gosh, yes. <laughs> so I think of it has happened to me twice, and I've learned my lesson twice in 10 years, always to follow the 15 steps and the contract. Oh my gosh, it's so funny. I just had this conversation with somebody else where we have these default behaviors. I have default behaviors, and my default behavior is not to follow a systematic scheduled, you know, step-by-step -step process for design. My default behavior is, oh my God, this is going to be fun. I can wing it, you know? And I, from time to time, I don't know why I decide that I'm going to take a little detour and every single time it bites back and it's so painful. So I hope you're done after two. I, I honestly have done it more than twice and it's just ridiculous. So anyway, good. All right, good. So that was one question. Do you, what else is going on? Yeah, sure. So I am, um, it again, flat fees. Um, in your um, approach, you request the full amount, amounts up front. So let's talk about up to the presentation date. So can you provide some uh, confidence tips um, so that I can go and ask, so at presentation, sorry, at consultation, let me clarify, I apologize. At the consultation, when I'm presenting my fee for steps three to five, I can get a yes. So in my, staying within my comfort zone, I feel more comfortable to ask for perhaps half of it up front and then the remainder two weeks prior to the presentation date. I'm not suggesting that's what I want to do at all. It just feels more comfortable. Yeah. So any suggestions on how to kind of stretch myself, stretch ourselves to get out of the comfort zone and get a yes by presenting that full amount at consultation? Oh my gosh. You just, you just hit the nail on the head. That's the problem with flat fees, right? We begin an internal negotiating with ourselves. We know that we should ask for $15,000 up front. And we're thinking this is going to easily be $15,000. And I'm talking about a little teeny job, like a little, you know, de decorate the living room kind of thing. We know it's going to be $15,000 by the time we're done. And suddenly we're, we, we've got the number in our head. We know exactly what we should say. We go, oh God, that seems really high. Oof. I don't know. I don't know if she's going to go for it, right? And uh, you're looking around, you're like, hmm, I really want this job. Maybe uh, she's going to think that's too high. I wonder if I could... I wonder if I could get it down to 10. Could it be, could I say 10? Could it be 10? Because 10 seems a lot more palatable. Maybe 10 is the right thing to say. And we're about to say 10. And then we go, you know, 10, such a big number. Maybe if I said nine, 9,300, that's better. That's better. And then the last ditch effort is what if I cut it in half? So you only need 4,700 now and $4,700 later, like you're on the shopping channel, by the way, uh, and you're not on the shopping channel. So all, all I can say is I know that that's not the right way to do it. And I share your fear because that's what it is. It's fear. And 
sometimes we have to face the fear and do it anyway. Even when our knees are knocking, we know we should ask for 15000 And the struggle for me was I knew the number to ask for. It was saying it and then shutting my mouth. Because when I first started trying to say the actual number, I would say, well, you know, to do this is going to be $15,000. Now, I know that's a lot of money, but here's the thing. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and we're going to do this, and you're not going to have to do this, and you won't have to do that. And all of that blather at the end of it's going to be $15,000 is signaling to that customer that I'm not comfortable with that amount. So it's almost an invitation for them to try to negotiate with me, right? Mm-hmm. So instead, yeah. So instead, what I have to do is there's there's a trick that I do. There's a couple of tricks that I do, and the first trick is I write the number on the contract before I say it. It sounds ridiculous, but I know the number's fifteen. I'm scared to say fifteen. I have the contract sitting there. There's a blank where the number should go in my contract. I write $15,000 down and suddenly I've got some paper courage and I can't turn back. And I turn the contract toward them and I say, it's going to be $15,000. And then I shut my mouth. I don't say another word. And I have a, I've said this so many times, but I sit on my hands as a signal to myself to shut my mouth Um, And if my clients are listening, they're going to crack up because they're going to go, oh my God, I've totally seen her sit on her hands. Um, But I say the number after I write it down and I sit on my hands. And those two tricks got me through the hurdle of being being able to ask for the money. And you're asking for the full amount at the consultation as opposed to yeah. 50 and 50. Oh, yeah. I don't ask for 50. The only, the only reason to do a flat fee is so you get paid up front. So if you're suddenly not getting paid up front, why would you ever do a flat fee? There's no point. The one advantage of a flat fee is getting your money up front. That's the one advantage. And if you throw that advantage away because you're scared, you, you'll never run a profitable business. So if you think that you're not there yet, stick to hourly. Always stick to hourly until you're ready to really go for it. Um, and the other thing I think about is car salesmen. Like Everybody's had the experience probably of going to buy a car or going to buy an expensive refrigerator or whatever. You never see the car salesman say, this model is $80,000, but you know I know that's a lot of money and I feel really bad asking for that money, but the thing is it's a Mercedes and it's got leather and it's, they never do that, right? They say it's $80,000. And you just, you're, you know, I'm just sitting there with my mouth open. Like, are you kidding? Like, does it have a dishwasher in it? Like, oh my God, like I'm wrestling with my sticker shock. Right. But as the consumer, yeah, eventually as the consumer, I go, you know what? I really want that stupid Mercedes. And I know $80,000 a lot and I don't care. I'm buying it. Let's do it. Right. But I wouldn't do that if the salesperson, you know, had verbal diarrhea all over the number. You're totally right. And I think we have to just face our fear and just state the number with with confidence using the tricks that you said. Yeah. And and I go back to the fact that when okay, when that customer gets in touch with you, do you have a professional website? Is your email address professional? Is your email address uh, Enzo at Enzo Rico Design or is it, you know, Jane Decorates for Fun? at hotmail.com. And that's giving the client an indication of your level of commitment to the business, right? And do you do they get a return phone call within 24 hours or does it take you four days to get back to them? And when you call them back, you go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I've been so busy and my kid had a soccer game. Like strike two, right? All of those things that lead up to the consultation will set the tone for the consultation, um, and I say this all the time, if there's any way you can get someone else to answer your phone for you, do it. Uh, it's a completely 100% affordable. Have somebody who's good at sales, return those calls quickly and sell the consultation. And then when you show up, you already look like a professional. You, before you even open your mouth, it's clear that you're running a business. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so bossy. I hear myself sometimes. I'm like, oh my God, you're like the, the worst nag. But anyway, I, I, you know what? These things work for me and I've struggled with these issues. So I feel your pain <laughs> and I'm passionate about how it, how it works now. That's for sure. I have another question with respect to uh, 
uh, collecting 100% payment up front. And that is as it relates to furniture. So now we've gotten a successful yes at the presentation and we're requesting the amount for all of the furnishings and everything that the client has approved. And with in the past, you have asked for 50% on items with the exception of antiques and custom furnishings and so forth. With flat fees, you're asking for um, you're asking for 100% payment up front, which is a change. So my question is, why um, can you just provide deeper clarity on the move? Oh, you're saying why don't I collect 100% on the goods? Why do you now? Sorry, uh, let me clarify. So. Um, now, with flat fees, you've made the change of collecting 100% payment on all goods up front right. when you present and they accept versus in the past, we would collect 50% up front and then the remainder uh, two weeks prior to install. Okay, really good question. So here's, here's some, some background. When I first, first started, uh, we used to collect the balance upon receipt. So after we delivered, that's a nightmare. I won't even go into it. Don't do it. You'll be chasing people for money. And I always go back to if a hooker won't do it, I won't do it. And hookers do not chase, you know, people for money after the fact they get the money up front. So we did then switch to the plan of getting 50% up front, but collecting the balance uh, the remaining 50% prior to delivery. And then at some point we switched that number to 75%. So, um, and the reason we did that is because we also include a lot of labor and trades in our, in our jobs. So collecting 100% on a contractor whose work's not going to be done for 11 months felt uh, like it wasn't a good idea. It just feels like it's not a good idea. But collecting 100% on furniture, absolutely. If you want to switch to that model and ask for 100% on all goods, totally acceptable. Some of our projects, though, go nine months, 12 months, 18 months. So we are, that we're asking for a lot of money up front for a long, long time. So there's a couple of things. If it's a little decorating job and we're doing someone's master bedroom and it's predominantly furniture, I would get a hundred percent upfront at the presentation when I'm also collecting the project management fees, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or following the presentation. If the clients need to think about it, there might be required another meeting where you come back and they say, we've decided to do everything and we understand your project management fee is going to be X, so we're happy to pay that. And then we know we're purchasing goods that amount to X and we're happy to pay that. I would collect the 100% for that upfront because those things are going to come in quickly within the next three months. So it saves time. I don't have to go back to the client four weeks later and get the balance, which seems kind of silly. But if it's a project where there's a lot of labor and construction, again, we still will ask for 75% upfront and then we'll collect the balance uh, two weeks prior to installation. And we just had a project, quite a big one. Not all of our projects are this big, but we did a presentation that was 1.3 million. So you can imagine what we're asking for. Uh, as a deposit. It's a huge amount of money. And the client just wrote a check and, you know, was like, "Woo, my gosh, that was super duper exciting. But for us to have collected the full amount before the construction even begins, I think is a little bit unpalatable when it's going to, when we know it's going to be nine months to a year until we're finished. Does that, does that kind of clarify that? 100%. That makes sense. Okay. And I think the, yep. The benefit there when you're dealing with, you know, smaller, saves time and because it's just the duration of time is shorter so you collect 100% it's more efficient for both the business like for both the designer as well as the client and when it's a larger scale project and you know that that spans a longer length of time with a larger budget absolutely it just I think it it it's a win-win for both so it makes sense so yeah. you're, so 100% Okay, and if you think the project's going to be wrapped up in three months, then collect 100% up front. If you think it's going to go six months, what you could say is you'll take 75% now and ask them to write you a post-dated check for the 25% and tell them you're doing that so you don't have to ask them for money again. Um, but, I, but I do want to point out that when you're even when you're doing a flat fee, you still are going to be asking for money from time to time because we haven't calculated duties, shipping, handling, 
any of those small amounts that are going to be coming in. And so we'll once in a while uh, at month's end, we'll say, here's, you know, moving bills and shipping feel, uh, bills and fabric duty expenses, et cetera. And we'll bill the client directly for those. Um, and the client knows that that's coming because that's in our contract as well. Yes. Perfect. I'm um, just thinking about um, size of projects. I have another question, which is when, when we're working on smaller budgets, um, the fees, you know, the both fees, steps three to five, and the project management fees, steps six to 15, when you're working with smaller budgets, the fees can look disproportionately high relative to the smaller budget. Yeah. What are the ways to overcome any client reservations to this disproportionately high amount and get a yes from the client? Oh my gosh, you, you know what? You're so right. We had this lovely couple, I guess it's about two years ago, and they came to us with the tiniest little job. And re- really what I tried to do was dissuade her from using me for that exact reason. I said, our fees are going to look so high compared to what you're purchasing that I just... I do not want to think about how you're going to react to my design fees. And she said she could totally understand that and appreciate it, but she wanted to use us anyway. And she did, and it was fine. The fact of the matter is they just they were two working professionals. They did not have time to do it. They didn't feel like they had an eye or a feel for things. And um, I, I think that may have been the smallest job we've done in the last at least 10 years, if not 15 and they were really happy. And at the end, they didn't even really want to do any much styling because they just didn't have the money for it. Um, mm-hmm. So I think the thing is you just have to be truthful with them. And sometimes clients will say, well, give me a percentage. Well, you know, What's typical of a percentage? There is no typical because if your design project is going to total $30,000, my fees are going to look really high. If your design project is a million and a half, my fee percentage is going to look really low. Right, so it's true. You you just um, must be truthful, authentic, genuine. Yeah, and you know, and if you choose to take on these projects, ex- just be upfront and explain what the fees will look like relative to the overall budget. And yeah, I mean, I think they're calling you because they're they're falling in love with your work. You know, the design, your design aesthetic, as well as the way you work. Yeah. And so that's the primary reasons because it becomes an emotional thing versus a financial thing. Exactly. And and this too, you know, your your consultation rate should discourage anyone from hiring you who doesn't have the money to hire you. That should absolutely be the first line of defense against you getting yourself into a job situation where the client can't afford it. And I've heard so many stories of clients saying like, oh my God, that's so expensive. You know, I, I really want to use you, but it's so expensive. Well, I'm sorry. Like we live in an expensive place, right? All of us live in expensive cities or expensive towns, or you live in a rural place where it's super expensive to get any goods because they have to come from who knows where it's, we can't help people. And it's not a, it's not a, charitable endeavor, right? It's the we're, it's not incumbent on us to give our time for free so someone can afford something. Um, and I never want to talk the clients into spending more than they can afford. I want them to spend what feels comfortable for them, and I will maximize those dollars, and I will share my discounts to make it affordable to work with me. But at the end of the day, it's just not a service for everybody. It's really not. And I hear that all the time. Oh, everybody can hire a designer. No, they can't. No, they really can't. Um, sometimes you're just barely making ends meet. You're a single mom and you're working, you know, all of your hours and, you know, then it's not for you at this time. And the other thing I want to say is I really, Enza, you've got a, a very mature business. It sounds like you're, you're really busy and I want to hear a little bit about that. But for some people that are listening, like they just don't have enough clients. And so the thought of losing even one client is really really scary. And and I get that. And you get, you remember what that's like, right, Enza? So we don't want to make it seem like, oh, we just don't touch jobs under a hundred thousand. Like we're not saying that at all, but we're saying like groom your language and your confidence. So you're prepared when they ask those questions. Yeah. Yeah. Actually thinking about that, a lot of my business, most of my business is referral based just, and repeat which is wonderful 
which means you're doing something right, which means you're doing lots of things right. Because I started, I literally started business of design because I couldn't get repeat or referral customers. So if you're listening and you don't have any, believe me, I was there. I understand completely how demoralizing that is. So, so kudos to you, Enza, because you're doing something right if that's where your business is coming from. Well, well thank you. Um, I'm looking to continue to grow and to continue to become more profitable. So I think about, um, and, and one thing I do do is I have always maintained uh, relationships with my past clients so that I could remain top of mind for them. And also it's a very personal business, obviously. Um, so, so it's nice to maintain relationships. Sometimes you may do several things with, um, with a, a past client and they're, they're a repeat client, but then there might be some lulls where they're just not doing anything for the next little while. So I'm always thinking of ways to get the phone to ring. That's one area where I would say I have a lot more opportunity to address, like to work on. What do you find to be the most effective ways to to get the phone to ring or to fill the client pipeline so you're expanding your client base beyond your repeats and your referrals? Okay. Really good question. So, so, so much, oh my gosh, there's so much in there. Um, so first of all, I would say don't overlook your existing customers to expand your business. Um, the first, you know, the, if you're working with a customer right now, making that customer happy is a, is a priority. And we can do that not by giving into every demand they have and taking money off, but we do that by running a systematic strategic business that follows a linear process and by maintaining firm control of the project and all of those things. So first of all, you know, take care of the customers that you have. Make sure you're looking for ways to expand the scope of the job on the projects where you can. And I've shared this kind of stuff before. You're doing the client's living room and dining room, uh, but she doesn't want to do the entrance way. Well, you know, because you're looking at it, that not doing the entrance way is a huge mistake because you can see it from the living room and dining room. So go ahead and ask, why don't we do the entrance way at the same time? You know, Diana, the living room and the dining room are going to be amazing. Unfortunately, they've, their view from those two rooms is the entrance way, which is a hot mess. How about we do that now too? I used to be so afraid of that. A, I was afraid of asking, so that was one problem. But B, I was so busy running around like a chicken with my head cut off, I couldn't have done the entrance way if she wanted me to. And in fact, sometimes they would say, can we do the entrance way? And you'd go, oh, we'll do that later because you just couldn't breathe, right? Um, so that's one way to expand business is to groom and take care of those clients you're working with now. But the other thing you're asking is how do you get outside of that loop? So sometimes people will do things like uh, make an appearance at a home show. And I've done a, a lot of that. And there have been many times when I just wanted to make the appearance because it would be fun and I was getting paid to be there. And so I didn't have an intention around what my goal was. M maybe the goal was I was just going to get paid and it was going to be fun and I was going to get out of there. But I, uh, in 2008, when the economy took a downturn, I remember specifically doing a couple of home shows and I'm thinking, you know what, a new customer b would be really good right now. And so I... I realized that when I would go to a home show, what I spoke about would determine whether or not I got a new customer, right? So you can't just be at a home show and get a new customer. You have to have a real intention around it. So for example, I often get asked to come and speak about trends. Well, trends are fun, but trends don't get you a new customer. Nobody hires somebody who knows that next year pink is going to be hot. That's just not attractive to a new customer. But when I talk about the 15 steps and the process for running a construction project, I always get a new customer. So I, th I think sometimes you know what to try, but maybe haven't fine-tuned how you present that. Does that make sense? It does, it does. Okay, so what have you tried? Tell me what you've tried so far. So um, I have tried... Um, so with my existing customers, I say, I would love to also, so if I'm doing their living room and dining room, I've said, oh, I'd also love to do your master bedroom. So I have a client where I did their main floor as well as their, um, their rec room in the lower. 
and they're just getting married. And I said, oh my goodness, I would love before you get married, I would love to do your master bedroom. I think that would be such a beautiful thing to have as a newly married couple. So that's one. Did they go for it? (laughs) It's in the works. It's in the works. I love (laughs) it. Good for you. So I did do, I did with, it started with the living room and I moved on to their dining room as well as entrance. And then, um, and then, um, it followed down into their media room downstairs. And so I'm working on one, their powder room, which still needs work and two, their master bedroom. But I have had this client now for over three years and they refuse to have, to, um, have me return their house key. So I still have their house key. Oh my I keep gosh. offering to give it to them and they still want me to hang on to their house key. So that's a good, that's, that's, awesome. that's a good thing. Yeah. I've also, and this is a suggestion that, that you have made is I, ask my at the end of a project um both verbally and in a follow-up email I always say it's been a delight working with you and if you know of anyone in your network or social circle that you know is equally as lovely as you if you would kindly I'd love for you to recommend me yeah and so that has worked as well okay that, that's when awesome. I think about my existing network I those are some of the things that I do and always I mean I always reach out I have I, I reach out to my clients and my my existing and my past um, very um, regularly like maybe I could you know seasonally so I'm always trying to make, be top of mind what I'm thinking about is how I can grow outside of my existing which is you know getting people for example to to call me because they've seen my website or, and uh, which, you know, has attracted them and prompted them to call me. So those are the things. So it's people that I don't know or that are outside of my, of this closer circle, this closer network. Okay. So to get any traction online, um, there's a few things. I mean, you've got to keep new content happening all the time and you have to have it tagged with search words that clients look for. So what, what city are you in Enza? Toronto. Oh, you're in Toronto. Okay. So, um, so you want to make sure that you have like you, okay. If you were a customer and you were looking for a designer in Toronto, what would you, what would you search? Toronto interior designer. There you go. So there's your, there's a keyword that you want to have in all of your blog posts, uh, because then you're going to have more Google juice. (laughs) That's my technical term for it. You're going to have more Google juice and they're going to be able to find you more quickly. Um, and I think, you know, so one thing you could do is you could add a blog to your existing website, but I see a ton of people with blogs that are going to be super fun and entertaining, but not drive traffic to you. So again, if your blog is like, oh, here's a pretty pillow, that is not going to make a client come and see you. Instead, if your blog is a teaching platform, you know, this is a project we have currently, this is before, this is the after, here's how we solve this problem. That is going to get the attention of a potential client. So again, like it's just really about intention and then you have to do it regularly. Um, I think right. speaking at a home show, you, you were clearly super articulate. I mean, you definitely should be speaking at a home show. And I would say your topic could easily be your 15-step project management strategy. And you know, to the consumer who's not going to hire a designer, it's really instructive because here's how you run a professional project. Here's the order we do things in. So that consumer is going to learn something, but I guarantee you there's going to be a few consumers in the audience who are like, you know what? I need to hire a designer. I'm calling her right now because they're going to hear in your pitch that you do things differently, that you have a sane, um, not chaotic process for doing all of this when the rest of the industry is kind of crazy. Like, let's be honest, the behavior out there for 90% of the people who do what we do is kind of crazy. I love I love the insight that you said, in addition to speaking at a home show, but the insight that you said is, um, you know, our point of difference. And you're really selling your point of difference and you're communicating your points of difference in whatever platform to attract your ideal client. Yeah. And so the point of difference is really, you know, here's how we do business. Here's Here are the 15 steps. In addition to, you know, our other key differentiators that could be related to our design aesthetic or or our team of a our a team of trades and suppliers and so forth but it's also the process because our clients want to feel 
comfortable, confident, and that we are taking care of them. I love that. Absolutely. You're so right. So home shows are really good. I think appearing on a podcast, if you can put it on your website, you know, so that they can find it and hear you, you know, it takes consumers something like 10 times of having a touch point with you before they feel like they can trust you. So you want them to see that your website is active. Um, we had a, we did a podcast with Vicki Sanderson, who is a professional writer and her beat is interior design. So, you know, you're ready Enza to give yourself to anybody who's a professional writer and say, here's some tips for maximizing small space. And, begin to get your name into print in that way as well. So that's another good way to do it. You can also reach out to book clubs or um, community groups. Um, I know in Los Angeles, I have a good friend who works with the um, city of Huntington Beach, and they have amazing programs through this through this different cities and municipalities. So you could offer to teach a course on how to do it yourself. And, uh, you know, I did a decorating course uh, years ago that was DIY, how to decorate for yourself without a designer. And I think I got two clients from it because once I explained how hard it was, they're like, forget this. (laughs) I'm going to hire someone to do it. I think those are ways that you can step outside as well. And the other thing I would say is, you know, you've got to get good photography at every single job that you do or most jobs that you do. You've got to get that really good photography and hire a photographer who's connected in the print world because that photographer can get you into those popular magazines, can get you into books, et cetera. Um, the other thing, you know, if you haven't done it yet, but to reach out to developers and do some model suites or do some track home development and do some speaking for the first time buyers, or even, um, you know, working directly with uh, the fulfillment office at some of these development companies where you can be on site and help the, ch- the clients choose their marbles and choose their, you know, hardware and their upgrades and all that kind of stuff. That's another way to kind of develop another revenue stream, if you will. Excellent. Yeah. This great is, ideas, great ideas. Now, you said that you do a really good job of maintaining relationships with past customers. Specifically, how do you do that? So um, what I do is I send um, cards, little note cards, to each of my clients seasonally. So I will do something in the spring, in the fall, as um, during the uh, the um, Christmas holidays, um, or sometimes uh, last year I also did you know welcoming the new year. Um, so that is a constant across all. And then I also send cards for their special occasions. If it be a birthday or a new baby or um, a new marriage, something like that. Um, in addition, uh, typically around the fall, I'll reach out and send emails to my clients um, just to say I'm thinking about them you know, because September seems to be the time where things start to, you know, it's like, it's almost like a time of planning, Mm -hmm. you know, start of a school year, people are coming off of, um, you know, lazy summer days. So September seems to be kind of more of a kickstart. Yeah. So that's when I reach out and I, and I, you know, I, I just say, I'm thinking about them and, Um, I'm looking to book some upcoming projects. Is there anything that they're considering and so forth? Um, As well, um, sometimes if I come across something that just, let's say I'm I'm working on something and I see a beautiful fabric or a beautiful whatever that reminds me of something related to one of my clients, I'll just say, oh, I just came across this gorgeous something-something. I'm just thinking of you. How are you doing? Um, so they're always kind of top of mind for me. So those are, so I'm build, I'm maintaining relationships that way. I love the last one where you just say, oh, I, I saw this beautiful thing and I thought of you. Like how, everybody yeah. likes when somebody thinks of them, like it's fantastic. That's so smart. I love that. And you made me think of a few other things. And the first one, I can't remember who taught it to me, but it was somebody in the business of design community. When they do a project in a condominium building, they will leave postcards in, in the doors of every 
everybody else on the floor and if they can get access on adjacent floors saying, hey, we're in your building and we're doing work. Please let us know if you have any inconvenience, if you experience any inconvenience by our trades. Um, So it's a way of saying we're here, we're managing things. Let us know if you're experiencing any inconvenience from our trades. We will get on that immediately. And we hope to have our project finished on June 1st and we're going to have an open house. We hope you'll come. So they get permission from the client ahead of time. And then when the project is all done, the designer hosts like an open house with, you know, booze and whatever, and the neighbors get to come and be snoopy. And it, she, she, when she described that, I thought that is the best idea I've ever heard. And we have done that several times and it's amazing. I love that idea. Amazing. And we've done it on residential projects. We put notes in the houses on, you know, all the way around the street just to say, you know, let us know if the trades are parked in front of your driveway or if you see something we should be concerned about. And otherwise, uh, we're here if you have any questions about the project. And invariably, somebody will reach out and say, oh, I'd love to see progress. Do you think I could, you know, come and take a look? And we'll ask the client if they say no problem. Great. We, you know, we've done walkthroughs on a project. Here's what we're doing. This is what's going on. And then we've gotten really good customers that way because we're already in our ideal neighborhood at that point, right? I love that. So there's something else that's been in my mind. I haven't done it yet, but I started volunteering for Habitat for Humanity and I'm really loving the organization. I think I would like to do a build where I invite all my clients to participate. So I think that idea that you would host something where your clients could participate and get to know you as a human being and maybe meet other customers... Um, and meet your trades maybe, you know, if you could, because I think when you do a build, I think you need 25 or 30 people ultimately for the house. Um, But it could be your trades, it could be your clients, it could be your staff, um, it could be the people you buy fabric from, you know, like there's so many amazing people who make projects come to life and that would be a really great way to build community. So that's something I would like to do in 2018. I love that idea, Kimberly. I love, love, love that idea. I see it as you're talking about it, you know, inviting your clients, but I also see that being a wonderful idea for business of design community. Yeah. Oh, we're uh, absolutely, I'm going to figure out how to do that for sure, for sure. And then the other thing that we did, which was not for my clients at all, but I have a company called Design Express, and once a year I take people to a different city and teach them about design and architecture and all that kind of fun stuff. And it's just consumers who love design. When we were in New York City, we got the Tory Burch store to open up for us an hour before they opened to the public. And they served um, mimosas and little quiches, and our ladies went crazy. And in fact, I'll put the picture up on the Business of Design website. They bought so much stuff and the store extended them, a, I think it was just a 10% discount or something. They went crazy and bought up half the store. It was like nothing I've ever seen. And I didn't make any money off that. I didn't take any money, but Tory Burch was so excited. They said, you can come back anytime. <laughs> And they made a donation, uh, in fact, to Habitat for Humanity, I think, uh, in my name, uh, as a thank you. And oh. I'm telling you, that was one of the m- most fun uh, hour and a half I've ever spent in my life. So there's another thing you could do. Reach out to a great store that sells jewelry or scarves or something and host a night and invite your clients. Like, you know, there are, and tell them to bring friends. That's the key. Tell them not just for them, but to bring bring a couple of friends. And if everybody can get a 10% discount or something, like it's such a win, right? Oh, I have the perfect idea and I have the perfect place. Ooh, are you going to invite him? Can I come? (laughs) (laughs) You would love it. Oh my goodness. I have the perfect place. Okay. Well, I'm in Toronto kind of roughly June to December. I'm in LA from January to May, but you know, if I'm there, I want to come. I want to come. Great. Any, Um, any final question before we wrap up? Yes, I do have a final, a uh, couple of final questions. They're, they're kind of all in the same area. Um, so there have been a few projects, a few past projects that I've worked on where I've encountered the following. I'm having to work with clients' existing elements in their space that might not be something that I would do. They're, they're, not, they're, kind of, they're not ideal, okay. but, you know, you work with it. Um, so that's one thing. And, this, and the second... Sometimes I'm 
I'm dealing with only being able to partially complete the spaces. So while I present a complete presentation that includes every single element, every single thing, um, I'm not able to fulfill all. And they'll say, oh, we'll do, we, you know, we'll do it in stages. But then things happen and then things, they don't necessarily go through with it for whatever reason. Life can happen and they become comfortable with what they have. So what that means, though, is one is I can't do a professional photo shoot because I'm dealing with some less than optimal elements. And the spaces, and in other cases, the space is not fully complete. So it could be missing some gorgeous window treatments or a statement ceiling light fixture or the gorgeous area rug. So what, so in addition to not being able to professionally photo shoot it or photograph it, which then I can't put on my website, which then I can't market. Also, there's this level of lack of fulfillment in a way, because you know yeah. what the end beautiful result should be. And you're like, Oh, Dang. Yeah. Okay. So, so in my experience, here's a workaround. If you think it's a customer who actually can afford to do more, but for whatever reason doesn't, is on the fence, then what you could propose is allowing you to complete the styling, you know, borrow the area carpet, borrow the throw and the pillows and a couple of vases and all the stuff you need to make it look ready for a, a photograph. Do the photography and show the client how beautiful it is because you've just photographed it. And then perhaps once the client sees it all done, they'll say, you know what, I think I do want to keep some of these things. I had that work for somebody that I was um, coaching or somebody that I currently coach. Uh, they were in the exact same situation. Something went wrong at the end of the prod, toward the end of the project, and the client just got mad and said, I just don't want to do anything else. Just wrap it up. And so she said, I tell you what, what if I handled the styling costs, you know, I'll pay for the movers and stuff, and then I can have it look beautiful. I can take a photograph for my website and you're under no obligation to buy anything else, but at least it allows me to have it on my website. And the client said, okay, fine. So she did. She paid for the movers. She borrowed all of the accessories. And I think it was quite a lot of accessories and mm -hmm. staged it all, took beautiful photographs. And when the client came home, they kept everything. They just kept everything wow. because they could tell like, oh my God, this is not even the same place. Now it could have gone the other way. The client could have looked at everything and said, it looks great. Now get this crap out of here. And she would have had to pay the movers to return it to all the stores. But you might decide it's worthwhile if you really need that photograph for your website. You know, if it's a mm -hmm. vacation house and you don't have one on your website and you really want it on your website, then it might be worth spending the marketing dollars to complete it. Right, so so there's that, and in terms of working with people's existing stuff, I try to be really respectful. If it if it's something that they really cherish, I will try to find a home for it that's right. But if it's something that's really going to ruin everything, then when we photograph, I explain to them that you know that just won't work in the photograph. So I'm going to replace it for the photograph with something else. And I had a situation where the client decided to, it was two wing chairs that were her husband's grandmother's or something like that. And they were just not right in any way for the project. So we borrowed two chairs instead of those uh, wing chairs. And the client ended up buying the two new chairs when she saw what a difference it made. But it was risky, right? I could have had to return those two chairs at my own expense. So this is why I keep saying over and over again, guys, you got to get your fees to a point uh, where you're making great money and you've got to get your margins on goods and labor so that you have some money at the end of the day in the event that you have to throw some cash at it in order to get that photograph. Because that photograph is a really good advertising for what you can do. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. I like the idea, a great insight there about obviously, you know, getting your marketing dollars up there so that if you have to borrow, 
you have the money to borrow so that you can take that fabulous photograph. Yeah. Now, if you know for sure the client absolutely 100% cannot afford to purchase anything else, then just know that you doing it is going to be an expense, right? Like I'm not trying to talk clients into buying what they can't afford. That's just not what I want to do. It's not what any of us wants to do. Uh, But if you think they just don't understand how magnificent it's going to be when it's finished, this can be kind of a way to tempt them into doing a little bit more. Um, Anza, you, I seriously, you, I think you're the kind of questions you're asking are fine tuning questions. Like it's clear to me that you're running a pretty badass business. Um, and how, how is business in general? How would you describe your business right now? So right now my business is steady. I would like, um, which is good. However, I would like to, I'm, I would like to grow my business from two in two ways. One is increasing the size of the projects that I'm working on. So the scope and size and budget of the projects that I'm working on, and perhaps add maybe one or two extra projects to the rosters that I'm working on at any given time. So So those are the two things that I'd like to do. But I think the first one is to increase the size and scope. Okay. And that, that, you know, you just, you do it in a couple of ways. Certainly you do it by making sure your consultation fee is bigger because luxury clients are looking for luxury service and luxury service is typically more expensive than service that's not luxury. So that's, you know, that's too bad because that, you know, it's kind of a false uh, claim, if you will. But uh, the fact of the matter is there's a perception of what that fee means. You know, if you're charging a hundred dollars for your consultation, that's one perception. If you're charging a thousand dollars for your consultation, that's another perception. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is do that trade day and be very thorough when you do trade day. Cause I've, I've used the same example over and over, but it happens every single time we get the electrician in and we know we're going to do work in this room, that room, in the other room. And he'll say, you know what, are you going to paint this area? And we'll say, yeah, we're going to paint. And he'll say, those pot lights are from 1970. You need to replace all of those pot lights with retrofit them with, you know, more up to date pot lights. Oh, okay. I hadn't thought of that. Suddenly the scope of the project goes up because we tell the client, listen, it's time to replace those pot lights. Would you like us to handle that now? And they always say, oh my gosh, yeah, please, before we paint, that's a great idea. So imagine that's just the electrician. Every single trade comes in with a new idea. Every single trade comes in and says, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? You know, as long as you're doing this and you haven't been in the driveway, you might as well do that while we're at it because it's not going to cost you any bit it's not going to cost you any more money for disposal. Oh, okay. So now I can go to the client and say, you know, we've got the bin. So while we're at it, why don't we do the mud room? Because you were talking about ripping those tiles out. So rather than pay for disposal in a bin again, six months from now, why don't you just do it right now? So I think that that's a really good way to increase the size of projects. Um, And then the other part of the equation is what we talked about today. So will will you circle back with me maybe in six months and just... I know you're going to implement because you're an implementer, aren't you? You're going to just take action. Of course. So, absolutely. So will you circle back then and we can do this again? Because I would love to know what you discover at the end of six months. And I would love to know how your business has grown. I will absolutely do that. I want to thank you so much. This was tremendous. Oh, you're so- awesome. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I love talking to you. I've been, I see your name all the time. I, you're there at a webinar or whatever. And I'm like, this girl's got it going on. So you have more to share with the community. I'm sure of it. Thank you so much, Kimberly. I had, this was a wonderful experience. I really appreciate taking the time today. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you so much. At Business of Design, we know it takes more than hard work and talent to successfully run a professional design firm. There are proven business strategies that can solve your immediate business challenges and transform your life. Don't try to do this alone. Join today and you'll have access to more than 100 video courses, plus access to Kimberly Selden as your mentor and guide. Unlike traditional coaching, which can take years to produce tangible results, BOD is a fast track to immediate results for independent interior designers, decorators, architects, stagers, and landscapers just like you. Monthly membership is only $67.50. Annual members save two months and have access to Kimberly's contracts. What are you waiting for? Together, we will achieve extraordinary results. Start today.